and welcome to PauseCast. It is May 25th, 2018. I am Jessica Alouette, one year older, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm Mark Hanna, I use he, him. Happy birthday, or Thank when you. your birthday was. It was five days ago. Nice. We have, we have well and truly gone past it. Isn't it amazing how humans work, how you don't age for a, a, all of a year except a day, and then on that one day, boom, you get a whole just, year older. Yeah, yes, it, it is wild how we've decided to track ages. But, like, I can't imagine having, like, I don't know, weekly or monthly, like, celebrations of, hooray, you're still alive! Wait, are you trying to tell me this isn't how it works biologically? I thought that was the reason for birthdays. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> this is podcast it is a weekly show about video games uh and the things we've been playing every week mark yeah i'm gonna start with you what have you been playing this week so i've continued to play uh more battletech which i've been really enjoying as a kind of a it's my go-to game at the moment where i, I don't want to I don't know how long we're going to be sitting down for, except I suppose there has to be a decent length of time because all its missions take a while. It's kind of a slow game to play. But mm. I know I don't need to get to the next narrative good point to stop or anything like that. It's easy to just play it for an hour or two hours or whatever, and then it's fun, and I go away just the same as before but entertained. Um, so it's a nice relaxing thing without needing to get in the zone for a narrative-based thing. And I've also been playing God of War, which you very kindly lent to me. Yes. That's been um, fun. Yeah, I, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts about that, because I have not played it. I can get into that now if you want. Yeah, let's yeah. get right into it. Like th That's yeah, what yeah, this yeah. section is for. Let's get right into <laughs> Fair point. what have you been enjoying in God of War. So, the honestly, the biggest thing for me about this game is that the Leviathan Axe, his primary weapon, feels really good and sounds really good. And that is, it's like, we've talked before about how games give you various ways to interact with the worlds, and in this game, the primary way you interact with the world is by throwing an axe and also hitting things with said axe. It, you press triangle after you've thrown it and it comes back to your hand. There's a little bit of shudder and the noise when you catch it is really spot on. And it's just very satisfying to use. You, a lot, there are a lot of extra puzzles as well as the mm. combat being based around it. And it just... You've talked before about how games have fallen flat for you because of sound design. I, everyone who's, listen, who's listened before probably knows that I'm thinking particularly about Shadow of Mordor. Mm -hmm. um, and I've mentioned that it doesn't make a huge difference to me, but in this game, I've really noticed it. That act sounds good. I, I hope that I, like... By talking about sound design in games, I make people like more aware of sound design in games. Like just pointing out, like, oh, oh, Mordor sounds really flat, but this other game in the same genre has this really, really satisfying feel to all of the sound design in it. And pointing that out as like a point of difference, I feel makes like I'm, people more observant of it. I feel I like I'm definitely looking forward a bit more now, and that's probably because you've talked about it. Um, like I've also noticed the sort of intercom stuff in the non-mission segments of Battletech where there's just like your ship's intercom. It sounds really good, particularly when you're, when you're in headphones. It's really, um, it's a really good in-universe background sound to have. It's, right. It doesn't need to be like feel solid or chunky like a lot of combat stuff you'd want to, but it's just... It could have gone off so much worse, and it just sounds really nice. But yeah, the sort of the feeling when you catch this wooden-handled axe is the sound adds to it so much. If I were playing it with the sound off, it would not be the same at all for that. Um, of course, the game isn't just about the axe. It's also about being super strong and getting angry, and that's kind of Kratos' thing. Which Boy. is a weird follow-up to playing Beyond Two Souls. Mm, yeah, because I mean, that was like that was the last major narrative thing it, you finished, it, it, right? It was, and like I mentioned, I got really into it, and now I don't know. It's it's a shift away from the type of narratives I enjoy, where the big thing about Kratos is he's super strong and he gets angry and he's not good at talking about feelings. And that's kind of his thing. Yep. 
so I don't know that I'm sure some people get into it. I, it hasn't that hasn't clicked for me quite as well. I know it's it's what his character is. I wasn't really expecting anything different from it. Yeah. Um. But still, you can't not notice that when you're playing the game that that's his thing. And yeah, I guess the whole inhuman strength stuff is supposed to be kind of a power fantasy thing, but uh, it hasn't worked as much for me. I guess that aspect of it. That's prob- that I think that's just me more than the game. It does well right. sometimes of giving you sort of a feeling of awe when they've got some particularly large enemies or vistas or anything like that. It's quite nice. But then every time Kratos moves a huge rock or something, I'm not really amazed. It's just like, okay, we get it. He's, I get it. He's super strong. He's, he's, he did that rock. Yeah. There was, um, there was one bit actually where I, I like taking narrative games seriously and I try to get into the stuff that they're clearly trying to provoke. So if the game clearly wants me to feel angry, I'll try my best to to go with it and care about that part of the story. But there was one particular bit which fell flat because I didn't know what to do. Hmm. Uh, I won't say what was happening, but he has a, a rage mode in combat that he can go into and a, a meter runs down as it's running out. And there are certain story points where it gets triggered and it won't run out until a certain thing has happened. And that was one of those points where it was just infinite rage. I'd killed all the enemies and I could see there was some stuff happening over this gap. And I didn't know what to do. So I was just standing there in this kind of like the perma rage was sort of a sense of urgency. Like you're supposed to do this quick. I didn't figure out I had to go over to this particular wall and press circle to start punching it. Because of course he knocks down a huge part of a building because he's angry. (laughs) <laughs> but just the fact that I didn't know what to do really pulled the momentum out from under me. And it was kind of an interesting thing to see as soon as you don't do what the game expects of you at times like these, it can very quickly deflate quite a bit. And you get that little glimpse behind the scene. It takes a bit to uh, get your head back in the game. Yeah. Um, although for the most part, it's been really good with that. The whole single shot thing has been interesting. I didn't know about that, I think, until right before I started playing it, where... There are no cuts. The camera is continuous through the whole entire game. Once you've yeah. noticed it, you continue noticing that it's happening, but it doesn't do anything hugely amazing in the rest of the game that I've seen. It just keeps happening. So, like, it's consistent. It would, yeah. of course, be a lot more impressive if it were an actual physical camera in a film or something. And I assume that's why people are generally impressed with it, with single-shot things in real cinema, obviously, you have to do everything in a single shot and everything has to go perfectly. So that's very impressive. So when it's done virtually, it's not as impressive, but it's been interesting. And I I think, yeah, it it definitely worked well in the early game. The rest of it, it's just been there and I haven't felt that's been anything special since. You specifically mentioned like when it's virtual, it's a little bit less impressive. I I don't necessarily think that's true. Yeah. Uh, One of the examples I actually want to point out to here with that is... Uh, a film that uses these like the single tracking shot, mm-hmm. uh, which is um, the Adventures of Tintin, which is an animated film from several years back. I've seen and it. it I uses... don't think I even noticed it was. It was it's the whole thing a continuous shot? It is, the whole thing is not a continuous shot, but there is like partic- There's a particular sequence. Oh, um, I think I know the one you mean. Actually, yep. Surrounding the dam, that was a a tracking shot that went for. I think the span of like three or four minutes and despite it being digital, like it's still an impressive shot and it looks, it looks really, really great. It's well executed Mm -hmm. when you can do it practically as well. That, that does become more impressive to maneuver a camera through a potentially very complex scene. And these tracking shots usually do follow quite complex scenes in film. That's not always the case. Uh, in God of War that I've noticed. Yeah. In some cutscenes, maybe a little bit, but they're not making a point of the cameras doing funky things. Yeah, no, that that's very much the opposite case in film. Just it tends to highlight a sequence of chaos. Mm. Um, it's often done in contrast to the rest of the film, I think, as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and th- usually with an object... That is the focus of it, moving through the scene. An object or actors that are just continuously in movement. Yeah, there's one uh, scene I've seen in the film that was a single shot that 
I remember being so impressed by it. It was a Tony Jaa film, um, and it's a four-minute fight scene that's a single shot, and mm. it's super impressive. I remember um, after seeing the film, I can't remember the name of the film, but I'm sure if you Google that, you'll be able to find it. But um, I remember it had the outtakes of it and the special features of the DVD or whatever it was on. And unsurprisingly, you know, a lot can go wrong in four minutes. You're not going to get the perfect shot the first time. And knowing that, seeing the film is what made it super impressive, as well as just having the super fit person managing the camera to keep up with all this and everyone doing stuff perfectly. That's the stuff that I guess I find most impressive when I see this kind of thing in a film. So I know that's not happening in God of War. It takes away from it a bit. But it's interesting that it does it. I'm sure there are people who know a lot more about film and the history and stuff. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I know I'm 737 said the, the protector. I think that is Yeah, the right I actually film. just I I googled Tony Jaw tracking shot and found the protector. Okay. was uh, the answer to that. So that that seems to be the film that you were thinking of. Cool. I'm I'm sh- 2005. I wouldn't I don't even know. That I'm sure that's right. Um but yeah, I'm I'm sure there will be some context or aspects of cinema history or something that I'm completely missing here just due to ignorance. Um, hmm. But it's been an interesting aspect of it. I didn't mean to talk this much about it. <laughs> no, it, it, I think it's really cool too, as someone who is like a total, I I am a nerd for really, really well executed cinematography. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things that I look for in a film that I'm interested in seeing. I look, okay, so like how well is like, how well are these shots composed? How artistic are they getting with this? Are they using the full width of the like ultra wide format or are they really not doing anything special with it? Um, I think of examples like John wick being like a particularly well shot film. I think of Mm -hmm. Mad Max Fury road as a particularly well shot film. I think Mm -hmm. of Tron legacy as well as a very, very well shot film and oblivion. Like all of these, all of these films have like really, really great composition and I enjoy watching them a lot as a result of the work that has gone into composing all of these shots and making them as beautiful as possible. Fair enough. Um, I think it's, it's something that's more like sound design is or was for me, whereas I don't notice it unless perhaps if something goes wrong, I might notice it. Right. But, um, if it's going well, then I don't tend to notice it. I think that's the ideal with the virtual camera, though. Like as mm-hmm. a as a concept. I mean, I've, if you don't if you don't notice the camera getting into your way, yeah, people tend to like that. I've never noticed camera issues in God of War, and in other games, there tends to be camera issues. Like you know, Monster Hunter, sometimes it'll get caught in a weird place, or sure. there are games that might have a fixed camera, and you can't quite move your character exactly how you wanted them to, or something like that. I haven't noticed any camera weirdness in God of War, so that's been good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yard Gnome 737 lost points that you maybe don't notice it, but your brain certainly does. Yeah, I just, I won't know what I'm You're not noticing, conscious I guess. of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I'm benefit from like, getting more enjoyment out of it, but I won't know why. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's like good acting, right? You notice bad acting, but good acting, you just think of the actors as the characters. Or if it's bad acting and it's bad acting to the tune of like the room, yes. for example. I think you're gonna say that one, yeah. Yeah, it's the room. Like you're just you're gonna point at that and laugh. I I cannot believe I had not bothered to look into watching any component of the room until very recently when um, Skeptic and YouTuber H Bomber Guy put out a video by the title of Serious Lore Analysis 3, in which he uses clips from the room. And it is mind boggling. <laughs> Just the things going on in the scenes that he has clipped there. It is absolutely mind-boggling. So have you seen the film or just little bits from it? I have not seen the film, just the bits that were used in that video, which is it's several minutes of footage in total. I'm not sure if I should recommend it or not. <laughs> I've seen it. I have but been I've told it, it is one of those movies that you watch with a group of friends yes. to laugh at how bad it is. Yeah. That's, like, that's how I You're saw not it. getting together for a high quality storytelling experience. You're getting together to laugh at a really, really bad thing. 
Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. I could get into it. Yeah. I'll invite you over and we'll watch the room. <laughs> could do. We'll need some plastic spoons to throw at the screen. <laughs> what? It's a tradition. Is it? I'm, I've, I've been told so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's a tradition to throw uh, plastic spoons at the screen whenever a, a piece of artwork of a spoon appears. <laughs> Which is apparently a lot. I wasn't watching them when I saw it, but... Okay, um, well... Alright. That sure is something. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, no, Tearing it's definitely one to watch apart, Prince. Lisa! It's, yeah, it's, real, it's really something. Um, but yeah, I've been playing God of War. There's There's been only, I think, one thing that's really bothered me in it, which is more just... It should have been a new IP, I think. I don't think it gets anything... Well, okay. Part of this is going to be that I didn't like previous God of War games. <laughs> um, yeah. But every time it brings up stuff from previous games, I lose interest almost immediately. And I just wanted right. to get back to its own story. It, it kind of reminds me of how I've heard Assassin's Creed Black Flag described as it's a pirate game, but you have to slog through some boring assassin stuff every now and then. And, I mean, I won't call it boring for this other stuff, but I don't know. I think it would be a better game without it. Um, mm. And part of that is just going to be that I'm not a fan of the franchise. I'm sure people who have been a fan of the franchise will appreciate that stuff. So it's kind of... I feel like I would enjoy it more if it didn't have the baggage of previous games. I have um, I've spoken to my disappointment about Assassin's Creed 4's narrative in the past. Mostly because, like, I am the person who enjoys <laughs> the stupid assassin stuff. It's, it's, it's a good time to me. I am invested in mm -hmm. that part of the universe. I thought it was a cool concept. It was the thing that got me into this series as much <laughs> of a dorkus as that makes me look. Now, here's the thing about that. Um, it is mostly, like, you could wash it all away from... Assassin's Creed 4, and you would end up with a better game. Like, I, I don't think mm -hmm. there's any any question about that. You would end up with a better game because it's not tied to the past of its IP. You could have an interesting pirate story ta told with that same set of mechanics without having to bring in the sage and all of this other weird assassin nonsense. As much as I yeah, love it, yeah. Again, there are a few games that have that have been kind of like that. I had, I don't know that God of War. I don't know that it would have benefited from that sort of clean slate in the same way that Assassin's Creed Four would have. I because the premise of God of War is around pantheons and very much around Kratos' past and seeking some kind of redemption for it. So to ignore Kratos' past would be antithetical to the type of story well, that God it, of War If it weren't a God tell. of War game, it wouldn't be Kratos. It would be someone else filling the same role. And you can still tell yeah. an interesting story with that. I don't know. I just... I feel like I'm... I don't know. This is, like I said, this is probably due to me just not liking the previous God of War games. Um... I think there are some aesthetic differences that are, that kind of clash whenever his past comes up as well. Like, he used to have those cartoony-looking blades on chains, whereas now he's got a really solid axe, and those are very different. Mm -hmm. The axe feels much more... Uh, I don't want to say gritty, but basically... It, it feels more grounded in reality. It's also... It's, it's reminiscent of the whole idea heavy. of Thor and his returning hammer. Um, it's a heavy weapon that you throw that returns to your hand magically. You can't help but think of the Thor movies, honestly, when, when, do, whenever I do that. Um, and it feels really different every time there's some uh, reminder of how he used to fight with these things that look like cartoon weapons. And to me, at least, I don't know. It's one of those things that just takes me out and reminds me of how ridiculous pr the previous games have been. Whereas I don't feel that way about the new stuff in this game. Right. 
And like, like, like I've said a few times, this is probably coming down to me more than it comes down to the game, honestly. So Either way, it's still worth talking about and figuring out. Yeah, for sure. But I've, I've been enjoying it overall. Um, the combat feels good. There have been some frustrating times when there's like a side area where, oh, this enemy is stronger than me. I died three times. That's a pain. I'll just go somewhere else. Um, but the puzzles are mostly pretty interesting. They do a, a decent job of, you know, teaching you this is how this sort of thing works. You throw your axe at it and this happens. But if this one, you throw your axe at this and this happens instead. I think I've only been stuck on one, no, two puzzles. Um, one of them was a side puzzle I didn't end up completing, mainly because I went through a door that I didn't realize I couldn't go back through. So I couldn't go back and complete the puzzle. And the other one was actually this evening. Um, and I got stuck until after a couple of minutes, an NPC made a side comment that made me realize what I had to do. So mm. that was fine. I, it, it didn't, the game didn't let me stay stuck. I've always been good. a fan of like trying to intelligently drop hints like that. Yeah. About puzzles. If that, like you can see your player is struggling in this area and they're not making much progress, like dropping a little hint for them naturally through the dialogue is that's a choice way to do it. And it's what they did. And there have been some other comments that are just nice, like they'll be talking about something and someone will say, Can we get up to there? We need to go. And then Kratos will say, Not from here. And you immediately know okay, I need to search around the area for something to climb or something like that. So there's a lot of nice little bits of dialogue right, yeah. that just point you in the right direction for that. And things are clearly signposted. If you can climb on something, it looks like this. If you can throw your axe at something, it looks like this. If it does this and that, if it does that. And you learn to recognize these things. And So it's pretty yeah. internally consistent? It, it is. It is. It's done, it's done well with that. You learn some of the um, puzzle pieces you can't interact with. You learn to recognize them before you can interact with them. There's an area you pass through a few times that has a whole bunch. And you wonder what, oh, I wonder what this is, what that is, what that is. And then as you discover the things that can get you past those obstacles, you immediately start thinking, oh, when I can go back there, I can do this, which is which is quite a nice, exciting feeling. It's got that kind of, um, I'm going to say Zelda-like, because that's where I first experienced, feeling of you progress to a certain point and you get a new item or skill that lets you pass a certain obstacle you've encountered previously and then repeat that process several times. Yeah. Um, and which is the like backtracking, a tried The backtracking aspect that is available in that style of game as well is typically more associated with uh, Metroid and Castlevania. Right. Yeah. I just, this sort of thing I've encountered with um, older Zelda games is, just how I saw yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. I just wanted to point out that like it, it maybe also slots into that sort of that sort of space, the Metroidvania space. Yeah, fair enough. And it's been it's done a good job of um the world feels open, but as you progress through more parts become open due to how the story progresses and the world changes as well as that, as well as, oh, I can pass this obstacle now. So it's got Good bits of, oh, I'm returning to this area. I can now explore for a while and do some sites if I want to. Um, it's quite good. It's got, a, it's got a pretty good rhythm when you can dedicate a reasonable length of time to it. Which I found when right. I was playing it during a weekend. Neat. But yeah. Uh, shall I move on to the things that I have been playing? Yes, please. I'm excited to hear what you've been playing. Well, I've been playing a bunch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our PUBG update. Um, I said ladies and gentlemen, and I shouldn't have done that. We have non-binary listeners. I'm better than that. It just... It it's, entered my mind as a show woman. I apologize. It's one of those annoying cultural autocompletes, isn't it? It That is a really fucking good way to describe that. <laughs> um... That also might be the name of the episode, Cultural Autocomplete. <laughs> That's, I can't think of a better analogy for that, so good job. Um, Why did I just bow to the microphone? What am I doing? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> nobody can see you do No, that. nobody can see me. Uh, it's time for our PUBG update. So I have been, I've been playing PUBG for a couple hundred hours, as I'm sure people know. Um, 
And, you know, I, I haven't been feeling great about how I've been playing in that game recently, so I decided to spend um, probably 20 hours over the span of a weekend all up um, playing PUBG and trying to get better at it. I can't Do ever think? comment on, oh my god, you played 20 hours on a weekend after my um, binge of Months Underworld when it came out. I forfeited that yeah. right. No, you forfeited that right completely. Um, and it, like, it just came up naturally. Like, I started out doing, oh, I'm just going to do some solo grinds, and it turned into, uh, you know, a couple of nights later, I was playing games with friends, and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, time just kind of goes. Yep. So I ended up playing a bunch of PUBG and trying to get better at it. It's... I have a lot of feelings about how I do in that game. And I have my stupid competitive brain that really gets at me when I'm playing games like PUBG and Overwatch and like anything with this sense of vague competition. Mm-hmm. And competitive brain gets at me and I have been trying to make it get at me a little bit less and trying to improve my individual performance in that game. Varying degrees of success, I did come out on top of one of the um, spiciest drops possible in the game at the moment. Spiciest? Um, like going to an era with a lot of people? Yep, that is exactly... I've, you, I'm glad that I have just used this term for the first time and you immediately picked up on what it meant. Sweet. Um, yeah, I, I went to one of the areas where players tend to concentrate the most and ended up winning out the entire area, which felt really nice. good. Nice. Uh, it was six eliminations to me. And I came out just by the skin on my teeth. Like it was <laughs> it was it was rough. But those are the managed... those are the best memories though. All right. If, if it I, wasn't yeah. a challenge, you might not remember it as well. I particularly remember like knowing that I had one more person left and seeing them there. Mm-hmm. And having you know just them or you. the yeah, and I know I have the height advantage. I've got the high ground. Does that make much of a I difference? Have, it does. It totally makes a huge difference, especially for visibility. Okay. Um, and I had just the right item to be able to push them into a corner. Nice. And push them away from the cover that they had available to them at the time. Ah, uh, yeah. And that was the. It was the game-winning play for me, and I made it into the top ten in that game. Nice. It felt great. Mm. So, like, I've, I've gotten a little bit better at PUBG. I'm not perfect, and I still have a lot I can improve on, especially around, like, positioning. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting there. Nice. Feels a little better. Um, that's PUBG update over. I have also been playing Project Cars a simulation heavy racing game i've been playing through that career mode which starts um if you choose the lowest tier on the career mode uh, it will start you out racing go-karts which is very fun yeah i'm still surprised that 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 was in the game because i would have thought that that would be it would feel very different to racing cars it totally does too because go-karts are way more responsive than an actual vehicle is they're way more grippy Mm. and so you don't have to be so easy on the brakes and acceleration. And so it, it kind of eases you in. And now I'm, I'm in the second tier, the super carts, mm-hmm. but my performance in the first season was doing well enough that I got offers to go drive actual cars. So I've done, done a few events doing that, um, which has been good fun. It, it nice. is, it is definitely a huge transition to start doing that. Mm-hmm. And recently I started doing full fat versions of that is what I've decided to call them. Is that when you turn on all of the simulation aspects? Well, all of the simulation aspects are already on for me. Okay. Um, and they were from second one, but what project cars allows you to do is on a per session basis, you can adjust AI difficulty and you can adjust session length. Oh yeah. Wait, session length. So yeah, so um in an average race event with actual vehicles, not carts, 
Uh, there is three stages. Okay. There is a practice stage, then there is a qualifying stage, and then the actual race. Oh. So practice will allow you to just get out on the track and set your best lap time and get a feel for the vehicle that you're driving. And 100% session length for that is 30 minutes of real time. It's a long time. Yeah, it is. But I have found myself wanting to have that much time to practice with the vehicle. Wow. Yeah. So that that is what has led me to actually participate in full fat uh, practice sessions. Then qualifiers also at 100% length, but you get um, 15 minutes mm-hmm. instead of the half an hour. And, and is that to decide your starting position? Yes, that's right. And that's where times actually matter. And then it goes into the actual race. So most of the racing games that I've played, no, all of the racing games that I've played have been very arcadey, and it's always been, hey, you should be coming first. Mm. Is I know this game's not arcadey, but are you sort of expected to always be able to come first, or is it expected that you will not always come first and stuff will still progress? It is expected that you'll not always come first. Have you been finding coming first or not coming first? Uh, I have been finding the fight for first kind of a mixed bag. I'm still learning to control a lot of the vehicles that are in that game. I mm-hmm. think the the one I've put the most time into has got about 200 kilometers on the odometer at this point. What sort of time is that equivalent to? Um, if you know, if you don't know, then it's fine. Probably two or three hours just in that vehicle. Okay. So a, a non-trivial amount of time practicing in that vehicle. That's that's what I've got the most experience with at the moment. Um, so I'm still getting used to a lot of that. Uh, and so I don't always come in first. I will have issues where I will go off the track. Um, I've run out of fuel oh, a couple they have of that. times. Yeah, there's actual like fuel measurements. You, on longer races, may have to take pit stops. Uh, mechanical failures are also a possibility. Um, How is that? Is take... that determined randomly? or, or... I'm not entirely sure how mechanical failures work in project cars i haven't looked into it too deep fair enough but uh it would be possible for components on your vehicle to fail uh it's possible for items like your um, drivetrain to become damaged meaning that your car will always default to turning in a certain direction so if you hit a wall particularly hard on one side you may find that you are just turning to that side naturally, and so you have to counter steer, which is going to sacrifice your top speed until you can go into the pit lane and actually get it repaired. <laughs> uh, there's a full, full-on full pitting system. Um, it's quite impressive, the level of simulation that is going on there and how much it distinctly does not feel like an arcade game. Right. Um, I, I like it. I like yeah, it a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, one of the things that's held me off from trying Project Cars mm-hmm. has been that I wasn't sure how I would feel about a game that is more motorsport focused a while back. And when I started first playing Grid 2, which I talked about a couple episodes ago, mm-hmm. uh, that was a more motorsport approach. I wasn't sure how I was going to like that, but it turns out I like that just fine. Is that motorsport as opposed to like street racing? Yeah, motorsport as opposed to street racing okay. or uh, the kind of racing that you see on the open world, like uh, Forza Horizon 3. Right. One of the reasons that appealed to me was it was like, oh, it looks like it's one of the few racing games on the market that's like got a modern approach to open world design. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was why I originally wanted to try that game out but now that i know that i'm okay with also just the motorsport aspect of it i'm i I feel like a lot more games have opened up to me nice that's 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 quite interesting are you looking at any others 
as a result you're thinking of? I mean, it sounds like you're happy playing this game for a while. Yeah, I'm I'm going to be happy playing Project Cars for a while. Um, is this more of a future thing that now when a game like this comes out, you might actually look at it more than you would have before? Yeah, um, like Forza Motorsport is now on my radar, where okay. just previously the Horizon versions were on my radar at all. Right. But now the, now the Motorsport versions are on my radar. Uh, Project Cars 2 oh, is I on my radar. What, there was one. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's... It's opened up some possibility for me. I'm, I'm kind of into it. Nice. Um, Yard Gnome 737 in the chat also points out that kilometer on the odometer is fun to say, which is true. <laughs> Uh, as soon as I realized that I'd asked the time and you said it, my brain started calculating, okay, so the average speed would be. <laughs> it, it, I was, I'm going to say the average speed is probably hovering around 100 kilometers an hour all up. Okay, I was going to guess 80 since you said 200 Ks in two to three hours. Yeah, I, 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 if I had to guess, I'd, I'd say my average speed would probably be around uh, 100. I could probably find... The actual statistic, there's some pretty <laughs> detailed reporting going on. Oh, interesting. Yeah. How does the um, career mode progression feel, uh, particularly in terms of pace? Because it sounds like you've played a decent amount of this game, but there's still a long way to go in terms of the career mode. Yeah, so um, career mode is kind of divided up into events that take place over the course of a calendar year, which is your season. And it sounds like these events can be like a whole session as one event if it's 45 minutes before you even race yeah um it it fortunately you can stop them at any time like if you if you are comfortable enough with the time you set in practice session quite early by the way you can <laughs> just you can stop into the pit box and progress the rest of the time at you know 60x speed and it'll be over in a few seconds right so you don't have to commit to the full length if you feel comfortable with uh, the amount that you're doing. You can also skip them entirely. Like, you can skip practice sessions entirely if you feel comfortable with it. I don't think you can skip qualifiers. Right, it makes sense. You can also simulate them with AI drivers. If you have driven on the course before and have set times, uh, it does allow you to pull on an AI driver that will simulate approximately your driving style and uh, lap time was it this game it was a different game wasn't it where you were talking about how they generated driving ai based off other players so that is forza horizon right. and forza motorsport both do that so they it's both... interesting this one sounds like it's got a similar sort of thing where it can generate a fake you it's local only but yes um forza is kind of a little bit more impressive in my mind because it can transmit that data to remote copies of Forza that are not yours. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that is a really, really fascinating aspect of the terribly named Drivatar system. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, you remember? I agree. It's not the best name. Um, and then the last thing I've been playing is Persona 5. How's that been? Well, I've put 30 hours into Persona 5 so far, so you tell me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, good. You haven't run into any uh, similar shit that, as the last one then? No, I haven't, uh, which is definitely, definitely refreshing. I don't know of any in there, so hopefully there just isn't any. Uh, as far as I know, in Persona 5, there are characters that are like transphobic or homophobic caricatures, but they are their presence is much lesser than it was in persona 4 where you have some of those caricatures and problems as part of the main cast right which does not seem to be the case here okay do you know if at least those characters are like clearly not meant to be liked uh i don't know if they are intended to be disliked i haven't i th i think there is one group that there's one group of men that is definitely intended to be disliked okay um and then there is another character who is referred to as a drag queen uh who is stern but not 
unlikable. Not intended to be disliked by the audience, I believe. Okay. Um, I haven't seen anything particularly egregious in comparison to Persona 4, shall we say? Good. But, That's uh, good. Yep, yeah, I'm keeping my eyes open. As- okay, uh, now aside from the bad shit that we're worried about, is it like, are you mm-hmm. enjoying it? Is it fun? Yes. Good. <laughs> I am having That's a very also good time important. with it. Uh, Persona 5 is stylish in a way that hits all the right buttons for me. To start, like, the the art style and aesthetic around it is consistent and extremely well executed. Yeah, the UI is really um, something, isn't it? It's really something. It, it, it really feels dynamic, and that's a lot more than can be said for most game UIs. Mm-hmm. Um, like you, th- you honestly think most most UIs are pretty static, um, especially in like first person shooters, for example. Like all of those elements feel very static. Persona f- has a tendency to make them feel like they have come alive. There's a lot of motion. Uh, there's a lot of really cool effects work going on, and it, it makes it a joy to look at. Nice. Um, the writing, it still definitely feels like a mixed bag to me. It doesn't feel egregiously bad, but like I can definitely see some like quirks in the translation that just make it go like, what? Oh, okay. Um... Which I, I, I think I mentioned last episode as well, that there there was a whole site dedicated to chronicling localization issues with Persona 5 around the time of its launch from someone who had worked on the localization component of the game. Right, they'd worked on it and they made a site documenting the problems with it? Yep. Interesting. Yeah, I believe that was... Like, I I'm don't remember the specific circumstances around it, so sure. I may be misremembering this Mm -hmm. don't take it as gospel um but i believe some of the circumstances were around that where they weren't satisfied with the quality of work that was being put out as well right and or higher quality work had been rejected Mm -hmm. for some reason or another um and so that was made as a as a project that was documenting the original work as well as the localization around it. I, I, again, could totally be wrong about the context of that site and why it was created. Uh, I need to go look into it a little bit further. Fair enough. But yeah, uh, I, I've just... It, it, there are things that I have noticed in that game that don't quite match up, so uh, it's a minor concern all up. Uh, villains are cool. The... Uh, palace system, I guess. I don't. I don't know how to explain it. It's quite cool. The randomly generated dungeons, the mementos, are pretty cool as well. And I'm starting to get to the point where there are some twists and turns and kinks in the narrative that are making it even more interesting. Like I, I feel like I've gotten, I've gotten past the basics, and now is when the kitty gloves are going to start to come off mm-hmm. and it's going to start ramping up things a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And, you know, consider- considering the content of what was in the kitty gloves territory, I I am curious to see where this goes. I've spotted some themes that I expect will be prominent as we go on. Um... Not a whole lot more to say about that. That the mechanics in that game are really good. Uh, I might have to have a chat with Ash about maybe doing some spoilery stuff for the show. We can have a talk about each palace, something like that. We'll see. Cool. Yeah, I've seen some bits of the game, but that's about Not as far as it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I I understand when like when you say palace and stuff. I know enough to understand what that. You know, I understand to. what that means. Like, yeah. palaces of the dungeons. Mm. 
for those who aren't in the know. Um, they are created in a separate world, and they are created by people whose desires are distorted. Um, so they have particularly strong desires that have manifested this palace. Uh, for example, the one I completed was a bank hovering above a city uh, created as a manifestation of um, the villain's desire to use the citizens of that city as his personal ATMs, essentially. Um, exploiting them for his own gain. So he saw the whole city as his bank. And that was how the palace was created. Does that make sense yep, to that, someone who... Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that makes perfect sense. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. I just want to make sure I am explaining this correctly. It's not one of the palaces that I saw, but from your description, it makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else you want? To, what else you want to talk about? Um, I've found something interesting with BattleTech actually. Just the um, the niche yeah, filled for me. So I've kept infrequently but like over several years returning i've kept returning to mount and blade as mm -hmm. a game that scratches a particular itch for me where you can sort of build something up and the rest of the world doesn't change along with that like as you get stronger the rest of the stuff gets stronger isn't how it works you can always um go and have some easy fights if you want and the tough stuff is is still there and you can focus on um, hiring a bunch of troops to have some bigger fights or trading or whatever. And it's this nice feeling of just building something that's just around you and the rest of the world is there and stuff's going on, but it's not about you. It's a really cool feeling that not a lot of games seem to cater for that I've found. And mm -hmm. now Battletech is scratching that same itch for me. It's really nice to come back and there's this mercenary company that I've built up and here are my mechs that I have. And it's not that these are the ones that you get. It's these are the ones I've managed to scrap. And a lot of them will have like the story associated with them because this one, I it's a rare mech that I saw that I took out the legs so I could salvage more of it and get the full chassis after, after one fight kind of stuff. Right. It's really nice to have a game that I can come back to. And there's a story behind every piece of the thing that I've built. And it's independent of the narrative and the world just exists and goes on a bit without me and I can just wander around in it. It's it's really nice. I, I haven't found many games at all that um that scratch that itch and, and Battletech's become one of them and I'm really happy about that. I'm looking forward to the incoming patch they've talked about in July or June. Um that it sounds like they'll let the there still be some lower difficulty areas remaining because the overall difficulty level does increase as the story goes on so that i'm hmm. looking forward to that changing because in the late game it there's not really much of a role for light mechs for example there isn't really any downside to just sending in your heaviest mechs every time and they're just tougher and stronger and they go a little bit later in the turn um Whereas if there were some easy fights around that I could send in some new recruits and some and some lighter mix to an easier fight if I wanted to. Um, so I'm looking forward to that coming. But yeah, it's it's really nice to have finally found another game that I can go do for this because I'm really not very great at Mountain Blade. <laughs> um, and it it's not exactly super visually impressive either, to be honest. Um, it's... I can't think of any other fighting game that has combat quite like it. Whereas Battletech, it's tactics. It's something that I I know about and that I know I enjoy and am not terrible at. Um, mm. So it's nice to have a, a game in a genre I'm more comfortable with playing and enjoying that also has that uh, framework around it that I, that I can just scratch that for me. It's, it's really nice. It's quite refreshing. Great. Um, I think I also want to touch on a, a little thing this week, mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, Dark Souls. 
hear about Dark Souls? Hear about that remaster? When you told me about it before the show, yeah. <laughs> oh, you didn't? Did you even know it was getting remastered? I don't think I did. What? Or if I did, oh. it would have been like, you told me and I forgot. <laughs> well, Dark Souls is getting remastered. Uh, it's out. It was out a day early on Steam. Um, but it is out on PS4 and Xbox One now, I believe. Uh, it's a rework of the game for modern consoles and modern PCs. There's a few little tweaks here and there, but most of the core game has remained uh, intact. Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke with a friend as well prior to uh, the show, just talking about how their experience with it has been so far. Um, and um, I'm just going to read what they had to say about that. Okay. Uh, I think there's a lot here. Uh, there's enough here to make the game really feel new. There's lots of little things that add up, like a couple of nicer textures, nicer color palettes, Interesting little fixes like the Blight Town Bell and Silver Knight's opening doors. Uh, one of the covenants that was not really working in the previous uh, iteration of this game works now. And lots of nice new particle effects added to things like fire and auras um, and boss attacks and cinematics. Um, and there's also just this beautiful nostalgic magic of summons and invasions and bustling activity the game being alive again is so fun oh um, of course of course i hadn't considered that because that's all multiplayer stuff it would have died down and now there's a uh remaster being released that'll be coming back as more people are starting to play it all at the same time again yeah and it feels like Something similar just happened within very recent memory with another remaster, which was Burnout Paradise Remastered. Um, it was a rework of a game that was widely considered to be a classic by a lot of people, and it just it, it came back alive. You could get into multiplayer matches. You could race against your friends. It was that moment very much being alive again. There was also the um, when Bloodborne was a PS Plus game and a whole bunch of players who already had it came back for that time because new people were getting it all at the same time. The multiplayer stuff could be active again for a period. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was a it was a really really interesting time for that game, and I, it's a really really interesting time for uh, Burn Up Paradise and now for Dark Souls. Like I, I I've can't help but wonder how many people are going to be coming back to see that world again because a lot of people do have that nostalgia for it it's what seven years old now yeah and last time it was out it was a whole console generation ago mm. yeah i i had it on the ps3 i actually bought it on pc but i think i was really unimpressed when i first started running it because it looked like i was gonna to have to do a whole bunch of faffing around to get it to actually work properly and i never really ended up Playing it on PC. Yeah, that actually checks out. Um, you do have to do a lot of fiddling to get it to work optimally. I think, for example, it just started playing in windowed mode. Like, not full screen yeah. windows, just like in a window, I think. Which is, no one does that. Yeah. So, that was weird. A lot of odd decisions with the PC port. Like, But th that could also be put at the hands of, like... From Software had never made a PC port before, and they also didn't right. really plan on doing a PC port of Dark Souls. Did the other uh, two come to PC? I can't recall. Yes, they did. Okay. But there was never really a plan in place for Dark Souls to come to PC at launch, as far as mm -hmm. I knew. Right. And so when it did actually come, it was just pretty much a straight port with not a lot going on specifically optimized for PC. Mm -hmm. Just pretty much a straight port because From Software had never done anything like that before. And the community insisted that modders would be able to fix it. Sure enough, um, modders have been able to fix it to a point. Um, there's only so much they could do, but DS fix is practically considered a mandatory part of trying to play that game because... Otherwise, things are broken. Yeah, that's not a great state of affairs there. No, but 
the uh, the PC ports of Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, and Dark Souls 3 were all significantly better. Good. So um, that that much they have clearly cleaned up their act over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they have brought that back onto uh, PC with the help of Bluepoint, who did the... Uh, are you familiar with the Uncharted remaster? Yeah. Yeah, they did that. Uh, they also did the um, Shadow of the Colossus remake. Oh, cool. Are you, that's something that I've been wondering about getting, because I've really enjoyed the original game on PS2. Yeah, Such I have. Game. I'm pretty interested in that. I do have the um, HD collection version mm-hmm. of that game. I have the I have the re-release on PS3 that came with Ico as well. I've never played Ico. I've played a little bit of it. It's it's interesting. I need to probably play more of it before I talk about it, but it was it was interesting when I played it at the time. The it's a remake rather than a remaster of Shadow of the Colossus, right? They've done more than just update the visuals, even though they've tried to keep it pretty faithful to the original. Uh, I believe so. I believe there's a few modernization bits and pieces, but it was a substantial overhaul of the game's assets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't played it, so I don't know which I could recommend, but from what I remember reading, it sounds like the the remake has been done very well, but just in general, it's a game that I'd recommend people play if they haven't. And if they have, yeah. then revisit <laughs> Um, Yard Gnome 737 says, I think the, D, uh, the Dark Souls remaster was done by a studio called Q-Lock, which I have not heard of. I, I can't verify whether my information is exactly accurate either. Um, I think I, maybe I thought that because there was some speculation around what they were going to do due to some interviews at the time, and then Dark Souls remaster was announced shortly after that so maybe that's permanently associated yeah so that is actually developed by QLock according to the um according to the steam page okay okay bluepoint did those other things though and did them very well <laughs> that much does stand what were you about to ask me I was going to ask you what you were looking forward to playing this week. Uh, I am looking forward to playing more Persona 5. uh, And I'm looking forward to playing Overwatch. They have an event on. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm also checking out the campaign for uh, Call of Duty World War II. Oh, yeah? Well, that, that sounds like the most generic shooter name. It's a lot. Oh, let's not even get into it right now. <laughs> yeah, no. We are not going to get into it, um, but I'm checking out the campaign in that. I'll probably have some thoughts next week. Cool. Um, How about you? What are you looking forward to playing? I'm actually going to try out Tyranny because it's free to play on Steam this weekend on their We Forgot oh, yeah. About the Southern Hemisphere Again sale. <laughs> um, Yeah, they're doing a yep. spring cleaning sale in the middle of autumn they forget we exist but it's free to play right now and it's a game i've sort of looked at before but not enough to actually buy it but still kind of interested so i've downloaded that now but haven't started up yet i the main thing i remember about it honestly is feeling really defeated when it came out i think right after trump was elected and its tagline is sometimes evil wins it was kind of a double whammy I, i remember that um, that being the particular context that was released in, yeah, and it was it was it was unfortunate timing, shall we say? Yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm gonna try it out while it's free to play and see if I like it enough to buy it and then spend some more time on it. But I don't yeah. know how much time I'm gonna spend on it this weekend because I've also got running my D and D game tomorrow. Ooh. Well, best of luck with the um with the D and D game tomorrow. Thank you. I know that it's got some stuff that uh you have been working towards for yeah. a long while well, and are excited to debut. It's the last session of the side stories that I've been doing 
all of this year so far. I didn't realize it was going to take a full like six months before we got back on the main campaign again. <laughs> but it's the last of those before we get back onto the, the main campaign stuff. Should be a good time. Hopefully. All right. All the best to you and your uh, your players. Thank you. And that is going to do it for this 83rd episode of Pausecast. If you like what you heard and would like to support the show, we have a few ways that you can do that. Uh, the first is by supporting us by leaving a rating or review on the show on iTunes, Spotify, or your platform of choice. Anywhere you leave it, it helps us out a lot. You can also tell a friend about the show. We would really appreciate that. Uh, if you'd like to support us financially, we have a couple ways that you can do that. First, you can donate to our coffee, which is a one-time donation. If you go to bit.ly slash pause coffee, I'm just going to check that that is the correct. Yes. If you go to bit.ly slash pause coffee, you can find our coffee page and donate a little bit to us there. You can also support us month to month by visiting our Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash show, it will help you. You can uh, find ways to support our show there. Uh, Patreon is currently down at the time of recording, so I don't have a list of patrons uh, to give you all uh, this week. Oh, it's down. Sorry about that. Yeah. It is currently experiencing an internal server error. Mm, how about that? I'm sure they're um, panicking. They're code. The code <laughs> monkeys are hacking away in the background. Ah, oh, God, I hate. I hate that. <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, what else is available? That's all for support. I think you can help us with content for the show by emailing us, podcastshow at gmail.com. And I uh, thank you, Leon, for the use of our theme song, Honey Milk Island. You can find Leon's music and download some of it for free at soundcloud.com slash L-E-Y-A-W-N. There goes Mark. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. There he goes. Uh, Mark, where can people find you on the internet? <sighs> um, I'm sorry. I hate that that happens now. I am on Twitter at Honest Universe, and I write a blog as well, though not about video games, at honestuniverse.com. And you can find me online at TLQT or by visiting bird.school. Um, in extremely fucking good domain news, I convinced a friend of mine to buy um, hugecal.zone, which is my favorite thing. Um, I would recommend checking out their channel, by the way. Um, if you go to hugecal.zone, you can find them. They do good streams. I would recommend them. And that's it. I think that's it. I think that is it. We've wrapped up. Yeah. Cool. Thank you again for listening to this week's episode. We really, really appreciate it. And yeah. until next week, uh, we'll see you around. And uh, bird up. Bye.